I mean, the ob- the obvious thing to do, I suppose, for a novelist would be to take the blank and to fill it in and to use the blank in order mm. to explain what comes later. And I thought what you did was so much more subtle because you refuse to fill in the blanks. And in a way, you allow that blank to be something which everyone who meets him has to confront. Because yes. so often there are people saying, you know, who are you? And um, I think the Duke of Norfolk says, you are a person. And that's about as far as you can get to define him. He's a person, but he can't, he yes. can't sort of place him and ascribe any kind of lineage or identity or explain him away. He cannot be explained away. And I thought it was very interesting the way you, you allowed little things from his past to kind of seep through, as you say, in memory, but, but didn't sort of give, a, give an explanation of who he was. I think this is true to what happened because it would have soothed the feelings of the court if they could have found him a pedigree. But when they actually came up with some obscure Cromwells who had been great men but had lost all their money and they said, you're one of these, aren't you? He he refused to be, which is a very singular thing for a courtier of that time to do. But I think maybe the mystery was valuable to him, that he didn't want to be added up by people. There were all sorts of rumours over who he was. I mean, it's interesting that people said his father was an Irishman, which he was not as far as we know. But what did that mean, you see, in the context of the time? It puts him as even more of an outsider. I think he may have been someone who was content to accept other people's projections and mirror them back. And he doesn't seem to have taken any interest in putting the record straight. And uh, Henry at one point says he, he'll get his heralds onto the case and will construct him a mm. sort of, you know, manufacture him a, mm. a pedigree. And Woolsey, his, his great mentor, creates all sorts of, you know, outlandish stories for him. So there's, yes. there's clearly a desire to try to, to try to construct something that will explain the man that he has become. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, this is my device that Woolsey tells elaborate lies about him, which, of course, don't fit at all the persona he projects. And this is a sort of running joke. But the thing about the construction of the pedigree is is actually real. Cromwell's reaction was to say, I wouldn't wear another man's coat. That is to say, another man's coat of arms, uh, for fear that he should rise and pluck it from about my ears. And he obviously had a feeling that it was essential to preserve that integrity, even if he was the only person who knew where his integrity lay. And his past, I assume, was a source of shame as well because it wasn't simply the fact of coming from such a low place, as his contemporaries said. It was the fact that his father was always in court, that he was a drunk, he was violent. If it hadn't been for his long record in the local courts, we wouldn't know anything about the Cromwell family at all. You say come from a low place and the, the, and the book starts literally with, with Cromwell on the ground, uh, you know, as low mm-hmm. as he can go. But he's been beaten. He's been abused by his father. And that relationship, you know, from the start is clearly is clearly one that has set the tone for, for much of the man he, he, he goes on to become that, you know, deeply troubled relationship with his own father. There, there were all sorts of stories current in his lifetime about why he'd run away from England, that he was in trouble with the law. And I've really chosen to believe that he was potentially in trouble with the law. He was certainly in trouble with his father. Starting off, as you say, at the point where he thinks, my father could actually kill me now. So you start this great project with your your character half an inch from death. This scene brought in its way all sorts of decisions that I hadn't yet made about the book because as soon as I saw this picture in my mind, I realised that my viewpoint was actually behind Cromwell's eyes as the boy looks at the stitching of his father's boot. 
I had realised the viewpoint and that brought the present tense with it. So all the decisions about the book had really been taken in one line. I think Henry VIII has an ambivalent relation, relationship with his own father. In many ways, Wolsey stepped in to be his father um, and a much more indulgent and cheerful father, much more understanding than Henry VII had been. And in a sense, I think, although there was not much more than about 15 years between them, I think it's possible that Cromwell found a good father in Wolsey also. And then there's this interesting relationship between Cromwell and Henry in that Henry is shadowed by his older brother, Arthur, who should have been king. And everyone is bound to ask what would Arthur have been like if he was king, if he had lived. Uh, the gauge gap between Henry and the elder brother is the same roughly as between Cromwell and Henry, assuming Cromwell was born around 1485. And then, of course, for Henry, there's, there's the question of not being able to, to, to have a son himself. And I've raised the question in the book, is it possible that some men actually can't grow up? until they have a son. Um, that's a question I leave dangling, but there's certainly something unresolved in Henry until he has his heir. But unfortunately, it does nothing to improve his character thereafter. I think also about Cromwell himself. Whatever his detractors say about him, one thing he was was a good father. His little girls died, we presume, in one of the summer epidemics. So he only had one child left, his son Gregory. Unlike Thomas More's son, Gregory seems to have been a rather underpowered character. And I'm thinking a lot about how does a son live up to a father like Thomas More or Thomas Cromwell. More of that in, in the second book.